All my notes are gone. They're gone. Don't don't take Google Drive notes on an airplane and expect them to be there when you get home. So yeah, 20 years uh, since I uploaded the very first MP3 of a Metroid Metal song to the internet. I've, I've told the history of this project to people and it's been on podcasts and stuff, but I've never taken the time to really think through the whole thing. And I thought that this might make sense, especially coming off the heels of VGM Con this past weekend. It would just be fun to kind of look back and explain sort of the story about the project, riding the waves of technology from the beginnings to now, how I somehow went from this to this uh, over the course of 20 years. So yeah, maybe you guys will find this somewhat interesting. It's fun for me. I'm sort of doing this for me. Uh, it, it feels like a milestone to me. Uh, and I'm proud of it. And I just want to kind of share maybe some details and things that you guys may not know about this Metroid Metal project that was named that way because alliteration just made sense at the time. So leading up to 2003, I'd been a lot in several bands and done a lot of recording on my own. I started with a Tascam 424 4-track, which I got, I think, when I was 14 or 15 years old. Loved the machine and eventually upgraded to the 8-track version of that. And that is what all the early MM stuff was recorded on. It was destructive. It was bouncing tracks back and forth. It was tape getting eaten. Uh, it was coming up with pretty thorough ideas and putting them to tape all at one time because there was no cut and paste. It just wasn't an option. We discovered the mini bosses in college, circa 1997, right? Dial up in the dorms uh, and hearing bands play the music that we remembered from when we were kids. Everyone is familiar with that concept now, but at the time, paying homage to it with your own instrument wasn't really a consideration. But then all of a sudden, all these things kept popping up, like, like finding forums, and then I uh, was a huge fan of Vomitron, uh, The Advantage, of course, the mini bosses, Neskimos, all these acts doing what sounded like a dream. Uh, not just because they were re recording music that they're familiar with, that we're also familiar with, but they're doing it in bands. I think for me, it was, it was hard enough to find musicians that you could jive with. And beyond that, finding musicians that you really jive with, but that also love video games enough to maybe want to cover them. I just assumed that that would never have been an option at the time. My first experience covering video game music was back in 1997. I had a lot of have some wonderful musical friends in, in college. And a buddy of mine was going to be a part of this local production of Schoolhouse Rock. He's like, you should totally come in and see if you want to like follow some chord charts and, and be a part of this thing. I went and immediately realized that I was not the musician they needed. I was not really good with inversions. Uh, I know what the chords were, but doing it nimbly and quickly and with very little rehearsal was not something I was interested in. Tommy did the show, and before the show, Tommy and I went up and sort of and played like medleys of all kinds of stuff. We did Inspector Gadget, we did Sesame Street, and we threw in Mario. Another person that applied to be a part of that ensemble was Kevin Lawrence, this 16-year-old incredible prog drummer that lived locally. So that was my introduction to Kevin, who would later drum for Metroid Metal. Kevin had to lay towels over the toms and, and the snare to like keep it down because children were singing Schoolhouse Rock. So Kevin couldn't do what Kevin normally did. Rim shots weren't an option. But it was a really great experience jamming with those guys. Uh, we actually went and did like rock, uh, sort of a rock version of the arrangements that we had done. Tommy and I had done just on acoustics in the intro and recorded sort of a little band version of that in the theater at the school. It had been a while since I recorded anything on my 8-track and I was like, you know what, like what if what if I took some of the riffs that I like and some of the ideas I had that had nothing to do with games at the time and just sort of pepper in a little Metroid on top, right? I, I was reminded of how amazing that soundtrack was because of Metroid Prime. If you hook up Metroid Prime to the GBA and you had Fusion and Prime, you could unlock the original NES Metroid on, on the GBA. And that was it. It was just sitting at that title screen remembering what that was like. I just had a vision in my head of what if a band was just writing their own rock songs. They just happened to be Metroid related, right? I was like, I'm just gonna give this a shot. I'm very much a rhythm guitar player. I'm all about the drum beats first before putting other things down. So I got out the 8-track, I got out my new balance shoe, which is which held my SM57 in the perfect angle to record my PV Delta Blues and at, at what I consider to be the sweet spot. Bought some new high bias tapes and decided to like give this idea a shot. So I wrote the backbone first and then just sort of layered the Metroid stuff on top.
And I went and posted it on the IGN boards. That was like where I lived mostly. That was the community that I was the biggest part of at the time. The forums were jumping back then. This is pre-social media, this is 2003. The reaction was amazing, uh, but there were a lot of people that just didn't think I had done that. They thought I had stolen it from someone else. They were trying to figure out who actually did it. And I enjoyed it so much, I decided I wanted to try another track after that. And that's when things started getting really weird. That's when things started leaving Metroid. It became a little more of like a songwriting experiment. And, and, well, was, the game was still there, but I was more concentrating on what kind of riff ideas I could shoehorn in there to make it work. And then I did a third song. I couldn't, it sort of, I couldn't stop at this point. Big Mushuga fan, had to pay homage with something. I was like, well, I have to put this stuff somewhere. So I, and I, I had my own web hosting and stuff. So I built this like, I built this super simple page for Metroid Metal and stuck this chat box on there. We call it the shout box essentially, but it's just sort of this anonymous place for people to leave post-it notes about whatever they had to say. That turned really gross. So that went away. And then with some help, the forums were created and people showed up almost immediately. There were, there were other websites already thriving, other communities like the Shiz, the Minibosses message board, people are already chatting. People came over, brought their usernames with them, got to meet some really cool people. Then it happened. It's hard for people to understand who weren't on the internet at the time, how important these individual communities were because there, there was no social media. So things like Penny Arcade, Homestar Runner, those, those things were massive because they were they were bookmarked. I mean, those, those are the places that people went every single day to, to take in some entertainment. There wasn't sort of a hub or a feed where you were being given stuff to look at across the internet. Anyway, Jerry just decided to tag Metroid Metal at the very bottom of one of his posts. And the forums blew up. At the time and for many years to follow, it was the most concurrent users in one day that Metroid Metal ever had. It was a huge influx of users. That's when conversations started that didn't even have anything to do with the project. It just, the forum just sort of became a community at that point. Made more songs, couldn't stop. Bandwidth was getting a little expensive. The, the files were getting downloaded directly from the site. It's the only place they lived at the time. There was nowhere else to put it. So I ended up creating sort of a sponsor section on the forum with sponsor tags. People could donate a few bucks to the site. Then the other thing happened. Nintendo Power did a page on Metroid Metal. More users came in, more songs got created. Things got a little complicated because I wanted to do more than what my eight track would allow, but again, destructive editing. Fast forward and the NES soundtrack is done. And I'm like, I guess I'm, am I done? Am I done? But then Dimebag died. I was playing through Prime again. Magmore was, was putting me in the lower Norfair zone. I'm like, man, I need to do something a little wilder, a little more leady and crazy. And so a few months later, I dropped lower Norfair. We're in Super Metroid territory at this point. And Viridia is so good. How could you not? How could you not? One night at my house, my buddy Dan Taylor, who was in a band called Milk Face in college while I was in a band called Mini Void as well. Dan shows up at my house with Tommy. Tommy, the guy who was playing, played the Mario music with back in college. They show up at my house and they're like, come to band practice. Come with us right now. We're going to go jam. You have to come with us. I'm like, I need to shower. They're like, no, you don't. Let's go. It's rock and roll. I joined up with Blue Dot. We had a little stint as Blue Dot. Had a good time. Ended up on cable access, which was a lot of fun. That's on YouTube. Look that up.
And just because it made sense to like, you know, in, insert this maybe to do something live with Metroid, the very first Metroid metal performance happened at Blue Dot shows. We did the theme and we did Kraid and it was super fun. Kevin from Schoolhouse Rock was in there as well. Uh, we were all good buddies in, in addition to, to, to having different styles that actually meshed really well together. And I had much bigger jeans then than I do now. Like Meridia is so much more, a lot, there's more going on. I'm like, man, I should get a, I should get a guest. I should get someone to, to play along with, I should get a guest. I should get Dan to come in and do what he does on bass for Meridia. That means I can't do the A track anymore. So later my little gray dude. Switched over to Cool Edit Pro which was the precursor to Adobe Audition. And then things got way more complicated. I have all these tracks I could work with, way more layers, way more tones, a little bit of editing, but at that point I was still using my RY10 Rhythm Programmer, which had one really good drum set, in my opinion. Stuck with that thing as, as long as I could. And yeah, that was it. It was me and Chunk Style. It was me and Dan Taylor. It was me doing everything and pulling Dan's tracks in. What he did for Meridia was so amazing. And it was at that point, for the first time, I realized that I would never, ever guess what I'd get back from Chunk. It's never what I expected, but it's always what I wanted. So that never stopped. That kept going. At that point, I'm just so excited. New tech, more options. And then I hit the wall with the drum machine. The boss music in Super Metroid is so great, but the loops are so short. So we decided to do a boss medley, do a seven minute sort of epic acknowledgement of all the, the, the big fights in that game. And that's it, little RY10. Couldn't hang. I had to do half the song. I had to program half the song ahead of time, wipe the memory, and do the entire other half of the song. Murdering an entire instrument track before you even know if you're done with the arrangement is very scary, but that's how that song worked. I love Super Metroid, but Metroid Prime is still my favorite game of all time. What better way to utilize all the amazing layers I now have available on the computer than with Fandrana Drifts? Oh yes, but the title screen's amazing for Prime, right? Gotta do that. We were in a pretty good rhythm. We were doing like a song every few months or something like that. And then I got hit up by Robert Koo, who sort of runs Penny Arcade Expo. And he's like, hey, we got bands, man. We got, we need music. You should come and play Metroid Metal. You bring the group and play a show at PAX. One of the coolest opportunities ever. But at the time, now every other act, if not more, are they're running a backbone on a laptop. But at the time, like that was not as common. And I was, I always had in my head this grand band experience. How, the idea of going up there with a laptop at the time just didn't seem PAX enough. It didn't seem big enough. And I was like, man, I don't, it might just be me and a laptop up there. And he's like, that's fine. But in my head, I'm like, I think something's coming, right? I think, I think there's an opportunity to do something bigger than just the laptop show with some lead guitar. It was still really difficult for me to perform cra the Kraid ARP at all, which is why that song is a lot slower than it should be. I had to make it groove because I wouldn't have been able to pull that off otherwise. So fast forward a little bit and Chunk and I decided to take a trek to MAGFest. Arm Cannon, Temp Sound Solutions. When I learned that TSS contains members that do not live near each other at all, and that's what they can sound like, and all these people are into video game music and they're covering stuff I've never even heard of. And we just, we were so, we were so galvanized. We took that, we took that eight hour drive home to plan what we could probably do for a full act. Kevin Lawrence, absolutely on board from the get-go. And we were like, we we're trying to figure out who else we need to play. I was such a big fan of Danimal's playing. I, I knew that he, there's no way he'd be interested in doing this kind of thing, right? It's a, it's a huge undertaking to learn like a set of music just for a show, but we approached him anyway. And Kirby from TSS, Kirby's the one that called my ass out for playing Kray wrong. The rhythm guitar and the chorus is wrong. Eight years my junior is just 
calling me out. And it was the most amazing thing. I'm like, well, we gotta get Kirby in here to show us how to do this right. They all said, yes. I had to go back and sort of make YouTube, YouTube's around at this point. I had to make YouTube parts for what to play. But the biggest thing for me is I wanted it to be a band. I was like, here are the parts. If you're doing dual leads, you gotta stick to that. But otherwise, do whatever, make it your own. Do what Danimal does, do what Kirby does. Revisiting these old tracks live, you know, Chunk wasn't a part of those. Make it your own. It was all about making it your own. In my opinion, that's the difference between a guy with some hired guns and a band. So we applied to MAGFest and we got it. You gotta understand that back then, you know, there were people applying to MAG, but it wasn't this sort of pile of people that you, you, you could pick from. It was a bit easier to get a gig if you, if you had a group that could pull it off. MAGFest was sort of a fan con with four bands a night, five bands a night. It was the night shows. It was two nights of bands and we did it. We booked it and we played our very first show. Immediately, I hit up Robert Koo, found the email from years earlier, wrote him, and I was like, I think we're, I think we're there. What do you think? Took no time. He's like, let's do this. Let's make this happen. We're going to PAX. We have to have merch. That's what bands have. It's the other box to remember. There's your amp and your box of shirts. My buddies, Scott and Robbie from Silent Uproar Records, buddies of mine from high school. Scott was the one that originally gave me the STEM nickname at all. Hit them up and I'm like, do you guys want to work on this with us? So we basically took the set from MAGFest and just needed to track it, needed to get it down. At that point I had graduated to Sonar, so I was getting a little more acclimated in a real DAW. And between MAGFest that January, and I guess it was in the next August, we had the albums printed, we were ready to go. Robbie went for this really cool minimalist style for all the artwork. We wanted to do something stylized and special. He's really good with line work, vector stuff. Debbie Chozo lives on. So Scott went with us, we all went to PAX, we did the show and it was just incredible. It had a huge reaction. It was literally the second time I had been around so many musical nerds in one place. At this point, there was a MySpace page. My friend Olivia like made a MySpace page for me. I was like, I don't wanna learn this stuff. She's like, I got this. We, wanna, we went on to play Mag again. We added more songs. I kept putting original stuff out too. Got more experimental, got guests. The first uh, NES songs, uh, Olivia, same same gal, offered a scream at the end of the uh, escape music with the idea that Samus didn't make it. Then the band years happened. We played a lot of shows. We had, we had maybe an eight PAX run, eight, nine PAX run, something like that. We played the very first PAX East in Boston. All kinds of fun little spinoff things. Uh, Junk and myself, big fans of Jonathan Colton. We actually were the first backup band for Joko at PAX East. At this point, it's no holds barred with the VGM stuff. I, I, I finally started to dive into other ideas, things that I always wanted to do but can never really pull it off until I learned how to handle. Learning those parts by ear, dealing with the software. I did my Marble Madness album. I did my Tron album, my favorite movie soundtrack of all time. Shared some emails with Wendy Carlos about the project, licensed it from Disney, that old mess, pre-sound drop nightmare. And so the new Metroid Metal songs just sort of tapered off because of other things. Started taking advantage of the communities that were that were fostering the strangest game cover ideas you could cook up. Moved to California in 2014. My wonderful wife encouraged me to go full-time audio. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be doing the things I'm doing now for a living. Now it's some sort of weird balance between the pro work, the stuff that I'm doing for other people, and the stuff I continue to try to do for myself. The band has hit this sort of 
window that I feel like the mini bosses are where it's like we're not seeking shows but we get to play the occasional one and somehow the band is still into doing this. I hope that one of the reasons that you know Danimal and Kirby and Chunk and Kevin are all into this too is it is just fun to play music together and I'm hoping that the make it your own method of putting the band together, letting people do what it is they do best even though it's not something you might expect. If you have the right musicians with you, it should work. So that's where we are now. The members of the band have the other stuff they do. We play when we can. We just played MAGFest in January and it was just such a lovely reunion. I think it's probably my favorite show we've ever played. the mixed media, all the people. Just came back from VGM Con, and uh, I knew I was gonna be making this video when I got back, thinking about how things have changed, going from that noisy eight track, you know, in the bedroom, to now seeing a jam space filled with iPads so people can follow along, going from only a few bands existing in the scene to an entire convention devoted to the musicians that do this kind of thing. We've come a very long way. I have so many ideas for new things. I have some Metroid related ideas. I have a lot of non Metroid related ideas. You know, we're sort of out of time. We have no more time in the day. There's no finding time. There's just making time. Doing music professionally now means that the last thing I kind of want to do at the end of the day is be in front of the machine. But I just have so many ideas. I, I was telling people this weekend that the riff vault is full. So we'll see what's next. I know the Metroid metal band has a future. Don't know what it is, but that whole project for me, it's all about fun. It's been about fun and trolling. If I've made someone angry because I eviscerated a Metroid song and rebuilt it into something mechanical and weird and different, that's a success. Metroid Metal is the longest project I have ever been a part of and will likely ever be a part of. Everything in my life now I can point to Metroid. What I do in my spare time, the things I enjoy, my career, the, my wife, my friend group, I can, I can point it all back to that fang jellyfish. New Metroid Metal stuff? Sure, likely. Don't know when and what form, not today. We made socks for MAGFest. They disappeared in 10 seconds, thanks to Danimal's chant. But we did make more, and they're available now. Why would you want a new album of Metroid music when you can wear us on your feet to your business meetings? I don't know how long this batch will last. I don't know if we're gonna get another batch, I have no idea, but if you want some socks, you know you want some socks. At the very first Metroid Metal show, Daniel said something that just like shut me right up. He said, here's to playing with people that inspire you. And that is all I've been able to do for the last 20 years is just be surrounded by like-minded people that, that are into the same things as you are, encourage you to, do, to be a better musician, encourage you to keep up, maybe practice on occasion, maybe not. So I feel that very much. So that's it. Maybe you guys learned a little something in this rant, but I just want to take this moment and share my appreciation for the ears and the words. With the way things are now, I think a lot of people sort of seek validation as a way to justify making something else. But I'm happy to say that my headspace around making video game arrangements is still the same as it was back then. It's about making music for me, right? I didn't make Marble Madness because there was Marble Madness stuff happening. It's just something I had to knock off the list. And there's a lot of stuff to knock off the list. So if you're a musician and you're having fun doing something like this, keep going, keep it fun. By all means, troll people musically if you can. Final shout out is to the Metroid Metal community. We've sort of ended up in Discord now. People that were, social media sort of caused all forums to scatter. That's just how it is. Now that people can live in their own social media hub, the regularly visiting the same places doesn't happen as much as it did back 20 years ago. There's a big handful of the Metroid Metal Boardites that are still chatting. People have gotten married, people have gotten divorced, people have had kids, people have changed careers. We've all sort of grown up together, and so I want to give a shout out to, to that posse. Thank you guys for watching, and uh, maybe I'll upload another YouTube video this year. Maybe not. Peace.